This video is kindly sponsored by Babbel. Use my code down in the description box and linked as a pin comment to get 60% off your subscription as a positive start to your new year. Have you ever looked at an old yearbook from the 1950s and wondered why teenagers or high schoolers look so much older than they do today? There are multiple theories for why this is the case, but the one that makes the most intuitive sense, at least to me, is presented in contemporary orthodontics by Prophet and colleagues using what's known as the functional matrix hypothesis. In simple terms, this theory states that the development of the face is dependent on the forces that you put on it. For the upper and lower jaw, which is what we really care about for getting an attractive or a handsome face, the tongue or other forces can push it downwards and outwards, and then new bone comes to fill it in its place. In this example, this little girl had a very severe sinus infection, so she would always be breathing through her mouth, and she wouldn't keep it closed long enough for the mandible or the lower jaw to develop properly. I thought we were upset because kids and teens are behaving too maturely for their age nowadays. We are so, how about that? But according to an Australian facial aesthetics consultancy firm, Gen Z are less attractive than previous generations. And this claim has most definitely been making the rounds. I do find it interesting that we're comparing an incredibly racially homogenous generation made up to the nines in their high school yearbook photos and, no doubt, set to get married and start adulthood within the first few years of graduating high school to a generation of increasingly racially and culturally heterogeneous youngsters looking to only maybe get married in their late 20s, early 30s, whose time of childhood has been greatly extended into going to college, not being able to afford to settle down or have children. But that's just my two cents. I have nothing on a facial aesthetics consultancy firm. Now, in line with this idea that Gen Z are less attractive than previous generations, <laughs> Three actresses in particular have been making the rounds as well. I've noticed this trend online which features these three particular Zuma actresses, namely Zendaya, Halle Bailey and Rachel Zegler. Basically, they are compared to, quote, some random cashier. This then branches out into other comparisons between a modern, famous, racially or ethnically diverse woman who is then contrasted to, and I quote, a white, normal girl with a minimum wage job. Interestingly, this particular woman who went viral for this very thing is called Jenna Renee and she's a very successful social media influencer and TikToker. The videos of hot minimum wage worker caught in the wild are actually curated videos on her channel recorded by her own videographer and there is absolutely no problem with this. Her content is very wholesome but the internet has interestingly spun a completely misleading and false narrative around it. In the meantime, a variety Actors on Actors episode featuring Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler has gone viral for different reasons. Basically, it's been received terribly, so of course I watched it. And even though it was received absolutely horrendously, there was absolutely nothing untoward nor controversial that was said or spoken about in this interview. This was a pretty regular Actors on Actors episode, but this is a somewhat routine response to these two women, especially considering that, like every Zuma, they exhibit the true multifaceted character of a human being. Both of them are pretty human in being flawed, not always, or particularly nice, I suppose. Wait a minute, like I have been a consistent customer here for the past few weeks. And of course, being products of the internet. But what I've begun to notice is that rather than these two Zuma actresses being judged for their perceived or genuine blunders, the personalities of these women has increasingly been associated and attributed to their looks, especially to their wide set eyes. If you don't see it, you're lying. Why is hypertellurism so common in younger people? Whether it is or isn't, one thing I've definitely noticed is that Gen Z women are on average less attractive than millennials were at the same age. They're just not cute at all. Gen Z might be the first generation to be less attractive than the preceding one. Probably all the chemicals and hormones in our food and water, plus vaccines. Why is hypertellurism so common in Zoomers? Source 4chan. But just before we get into that, I would just like to give a huge thank you to today's video sponsor, Babbel. Babbel and Maho Programmo de Aprendizage de Lingres. 
sometimes you just need to say it with confidence. But I do think I got that. I do think I got that right. I would say 90% right. I got that 90% right. I've been using Babbel since about mid 2023 and it has honestly transformed my experience of language learning. Babbel is one of the world's top language learning apps and I can attest to why this is the case. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you start learning a new language within just three weeks. And not only are these classes designed and curated by real language experts and teachers, but the type of classes offered are so real and so relevant to everyday experiences that it becomes almost second nature for me to just use Babbel whenever I'm doing something in my everyday life. I've recently started baking and I've really enjoyed applying what I have learned with Babbel to my process of baking. Você abre o Cota da açúcar, por favor. Agora, cem gramas de farinha. Agora, cem gramas da farinha. And I just like to stress that this is really something that I appreciate about Babbel. I am taught through real world conversations that will have practical use and meaning to me. The learning through Babbel is direct, immersive, and feels vibrant and always fun in comparison to the often indirect and archaic methods of language learning, which often make it feel quite impersonal and also lacking in that all essential human quality that I really need to stay motivated and interested. With 14 languages to pick from, I personally decided to learn Portuguese and I have enjoyed my experience thoroughly. As I said before, I went to Portugal earlier this year and it was the best time of my life and using Babbel and learning Portuguese through Babbel has really kept that memory and that flame alive. Onde você mora? Onde você mora? Você pode repetir? Você pode repetir? Language learning is difficult, it's challenging, and it requires commitment, but I'm so proud of myself for keeping at Babbel and enjoying it in the process. When I've had my ups and downs with my language learning course, it has been very encouraging to know that I can just go back on classes, that I can always review my classes, and that I can curate the app so that it really fits into how fast or how slowly I'm learning, as well as into my daily and weekly schedule. What's great about this is that you can set lesson reminders for what whatever days and whatever times you want. 80% of Babbel users who set a reminder actually improve faster and stay far more committed. And of course, with it being the end of this year, it is so great to set myself a New Year's resolution of continuing with Babbel, of improving my Portuguese and moving forward to hopefully go to Portugal next year, fingers crossed, and to be able to apply everything that I have learnt and everything that I am reviewing constantly. So like me, why not set yourself a new year's resolution to learn or go back to learning a language that you've always thought you'd like to learn that you've always wanted to learn but have never known really how to get started Babbel is the perfect solution for that click on my unique link below to get 60 percent off your subscription i repeat that 60 percent off your subscription for this new year and i love it when you tell me what languages you have learned or what languages you are planning to learn so please let me know down in the comment section what language tickles your fancy. I'd also like to add that by using my link, your subscription includes two free live classes. And remember, that is 60% off your subscription. Absolutely incredible. These deals are absolutely amazing at this time of year. It's unreal. Thank you so very much to Babbel for sponsoring this video and for supporting me in my personal language learning journey. It has been absolutely fantastic and I cannot wait for you to enjoy Babbel as much as I do. Now, let's get back to the video. Phrenology, a brain-based personality theory which claims that the size and shape of one's cranium and brain is an indicator of one's character, one's personality, and one's mental abilities. Phrenology has been a huge part of American and European social life since the 19th century, especially American social life. One reason phrenology attracted so many followers was that it seemed to provide the toolbox for the American dream 
dream. All classes of society found much to admire in phrenology. The upper classes liked it because it reassured them that the social hierarchy that placed them on top was natural. The emerging middle class and working classes liked it because its meritocratic message confirmed their hope of advancement through personal striving and self-improvement. Phrenology, however, differs too, yet has some very important characteristics in common with another pseudoscience called physiognomy. Both phrenology and physiognomy were popular amongst the ancient Greeks and reached their heights and their peaks in popularity during the 19th century. Physiognomy can attribute much of its following and much of its roots in East Asian philosophy. And that is because physiognomy is a facial personality theory and is often just referred to as face reading. I found this pic on Chinese social media recently and I thought it was really interesting so I want to share with the class. So in Chinese culture we really believe that your face tells your fortune how much money you're gonna make, what kind of life you're gonna live, it's all written in your face. One really clear example is if you have detached earlobes or a fat nose that typically means you're gonna be rich. But here are a couple types of faces for women. These are all roughly translated. Did you know your face will show if you're going to be rich or successful? According to Feng Shui, every facial feature tells your story of your destiny. So if your forehead is high, round and broad, you'll be successful and rich. Allegedly, a person's character and personality can be deduced from their physical appearance, most notably from their distinct facial features. Face reader Lori Bell Herring has made a name for herself on TikTok doing just this, taking celebrities or a general facial feature and deducing from this personality and moral traits. Now our nose is nice and long. This is a plus in face reading. Uh, it belongs to somebody who's very ambitious, who really sets their sights on big goals and goes after them. However, the tip of the nose is extremely pointy. This is rare to see, which is said to belong to a person who will kind of push other people's feelings out of the way to get the goal. Uh, there's more ruthlessness about the personality. If you look at her falling lines that come down in the sides here, she's probably been working from a young age and really thought that she had to work really hard to get what she had so I can see a deep sense of like, I've got to work and earn everything that I have. Uh, that's in the deepness of the falling lines. Then they're very, very wide, which is influence, it's popularity, it's being very socially connected then this is odd and perfectly fits with what's happened to her. If you look at the top tip of her nose, there's a kind of a deep indentation. And I'm not talking about the line at the tip of her nose, that's more common, but this deep indentation on the top tip there, I, I haven't seen that very often, but this indicates a boom and bust when it comes to money, fame, energy, because the nose is the money box of the face and represents our energy. Uh, and she's got a great nose for success, but then this divot that's coming out of it, this is going to create a boom and bust situation where um, a person can have everything and then boom, it's like taken out from under them. Now, what I find most fascinating is that in our enlightened scientific age, there is clearly a growing, and I mean a growing, audience for face reading. This is something that I find fascinating, but I also find understandable. Given the rise of facial recognition technologies, of artificial intelligence, as well as the growing influence of East Asians, specifically Chinese culture on younger Western audiences. It is a bit eerie, but it is also no real surprise to me. So I guess you're wondering why I'm talking about physiognomy's comeback in relation to the wide set eyes of the likes of Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler. Well, I think we need to consult the world's most hated franchise for that, Disney. <laughs> Now, usually I try to stay away from like film criticism and all of this because I know it's a very, very interesting genre with a lot of opinions and a lot of perspectives. But I think considering the fall of James Summerton, I'm going to take this opportunity because I don't think I can be any worse than him. <laughs> 
Even my laugh there sounded like a Disney villain. That's great. Disney has gone through a major rebrand when it comes to the presentation of the characteristics and story objectives of its protagonists. Woke Disney has also been made synonymous to Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler, even though the new Snow White hasn't been released. With everything about Woke Disney and how it is decimating, destroying the original cherished storylines of Disney Tales. I was expecting, for instance, the new Little Mermaid to be terrible, but it wasn't. It was pretty brilliant. The depth of character development of both Ariel and Eric, the introduction of a non-disclosed yet historically viable social setting beautifully illustrated the story's progression. I do consider both movies separate movies, as opposed to a remake replacing the original. And I am glad that I can and have gone back to the original Little Mermaid film and preceding series. And and I'm able to enjoy it for what it is. This, however, doesn't mean that the new and unknown Little Mermaid is bad. And of course, it doesn't mean that I don't sympathize with the perfectly understandable and valid criticism surrounding the erasure of a red-haired Disney princess. It isn't racist to feel this way. But people have begun to notice something about the new Zuma cohort of Disney live-action leads. Of course, this only applies to Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler, not to Emma Watson, Lily James, Emma Stone, or Naomi Scott. Remember, folks, two women represent the entirety of woke showbiz. Why do all the new crop of starlets being launched have eyes too wide apart? I don't even necessarily hate it. On some girls, it looks good, but it just seems weirdly ubiquitous. Well, when it comes to Disney princesses, this is indeed a ubiquitous thing. Having eyes too wide apart has been an essential characteristic of Disney princesses since 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The facial features, specifically, that is, the eyes, convey the character, the purity, of the princess. Disney princesses have been a crucial and perfect source of culturally promoting and validating physiognomy in the modern imagination. The wide set, big eyes juvenilize the princess, making her seem and appear more childlike, innocent, and therefore good and pure. A child is worthy of saving, is worthy of sympathy, is worthy of a happy ending. They are truthful and honest, playful, and like their eyes, they are open. Halle Bailey was bullied by the internet for her so-called prey eyes. And this has in fact been a quasi-evolutionary explanation for why Disney loves the wide set eye. And this has a great deal to do with woman's generic attractiveness. Babyishness, cuteness, and kint schema was first suggested by ethologist Conrad Lorenz as eliciting feelings of protection, nurturing, and care in others. In woman, it suggests submission, the prey that needs to either be protected or simply preyed upon. Neotenous features were said to be particularly important for women's facial attractiveness. Women with baby-like features, such as large, widely spaced eyes and a small nose and chin, were judged to be the most attractive in cross-cultural studies. So if this is the case, why has there been such a vitriolic response to Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler's look? on the internet. Both of these women, according to evolution and ethological theories, are the epitomes of baby-faceness. They exhibit all these physical facial features, as do all Disney princesses since the early 20th century. I think the answer to this can be found in the Disney remakes, especially when looking at what is the most crucial thing to emphasizing the attractiveness, the innocence, and the beauty of the Disney princess. The answer? The Disney princesses complete opposite in physical and moral attractiveness, which can always be found in the female Disney villain. Before the Disney remakes, there was always a stark physical contrast between the Disney princess and the Disney villain. This stark contrast has, in my opinion, become far more ambiguous, meaning that the clear line between moral and physical attractiveness in the pre-remake Disney era is no longer 
longer present. You see yourself as the evil queen. You are not evil. You are not evil. You're a queen, but you're not evil. Take Cinderella's Lady Tremaine's glow up from 1950 to 2015. On the ED92 blog, she is described as having the look of a rather elderly but well-preserved woman. Her face is somewhat wrinkled and she has grey hair. She has a crooked hawk nose, her hooded eyes glow green in the darkness, and her face is clearly lined and discoloured. Cinderella's stepmother, although clearly careful and particular about her appearance, is ultimately having her efforts defeated, not simply by the dreaded ageing process, but no doubt by the wickedness which lies within, associated, of course, with her physical ugliness. And this has always fit in very well with our associations and opinions of women and ageing. The older a woman gets, the less sexually and physically attractive she theoretically is. She therefore becomes invisible. Although biological constraints make ageing inevitable, human beings have always been obsessed by the myth that reverse ageing and everlasting youth are possible. The Disney princess, in her seemingly everlasting youthfulness due to a film being stuck in time, perpetuates this myth. Equating someone's moral character to their physical appearance was always a hallmark of Disney films. Until now, of course. Lady Tremaine's 2015 glow-up was very intentional, and I think it represents an underlying, although perhaps subconscious reason, for the growing disdain toward Disney that I haven't really heard anyone speaking about. Disney villains now are just as attractive, if not more conventionally attractive, than their princess nemeses. From Cat Blanchett as Lady Tremaine, or Angelina Jolie as Maleficent, Emma Stone as Cruella, to Gal Gadot as the evil queen in Snow White. The previously physically ugly, and therefore no doubt unlovable and evil spinster slash widow, is no longer so easily categorised and dismissed. Suddenly, in our modern times, older women can be hot, and they can be hotter than younger women, who are by default hot because young science. And I have most definitely noticed that this has not sat well with many, including Andrew Tate, commenting on a bikini pic taken by 52-year-old media personality Amanda Holden. Sex trafficker Andrew Tate decided to enlighten the world with his opinion on the matter. You are a wife and a mother, and you're far past a teenager. There is no need for this post. I'm sorry, that was my best Andrew Tate impression. <laughs> Beauty isn't so easily defined, nor so simply reduced to popular evolutionary explanations. There is anger that Halle Bailey and Rachel Zeigler don't so obviously or readily conform to their submissive, innocent, doughy-eyed appearance. Their character doesn't match what many of us have learned to expect from their looks. And therefore, according to the logic of the internet, they cannot possibly act actually be attractive. Not really. Instead, and interestingly, the internet has attributed their particular looks, that is, especially their wide-set eyes, not to beauty and attractiveness, but instead to fetal alcohol syndrome. Yes. Now, just a spoiler alert, 1 in 100 people are born with fetal alcohol syndrome, more accurately termed fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. The misconception that you can tell if somebody has FASD based on their physical appearance is not at all a universal fact of the matter. Babies born with FASD do not always exhibit or show symptoms from birth. For instance, both myself and my brother have FASD. Unlike me, however, he has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder with sentinel facial features. I, on the other hand, have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder without sentinel facial features. In fact, I wasn't expected to speak at all until I did, and my symptoms are exhibited in behavioural and social issues and settings. I only say all of this to demonstrate how misinformed the public is on FASD, and how easy it is to be so determined in one's own ignorance. And you see, that's why it is easier to claim that there must be something wrong with Rachel Zeigler's or Halle Bailey's physical appearance. And that is because our culture and its legacy 
are quite heavily steeped in physiognomy, with Disney being a very effective and influential conduit for it. It has, however, become far more difficult in the Disney remake era to distinguish comfortably between good and evil, right and wrong, hero and villain, based on physical appearance, which has always been at the core of every storyline. Yet, at the same time, we are subsumed in a digital culture that obsesses over and forces us to make judgments of others' moral character, of their moral traits, of their personality, via their digital footprint, via their quite literal, physical, slash digital appearance. And this leads us into a further explanation for the supposed moral decline and degeneracy of the modern age. Zoomers are just physically less attractive. Am I right? Basically, our TikTok conspiratorial era, and Zoomers in particular, are perfectly primed for the rise of phrenology and physiognomy. Increasingly, we are forced to make snap judgments of people based on their social media profiles and fleeting conversations we have with them online. We inevitably fall into the same line of reasoning that underpins physiognomic claims. A first impression, which is almost always physical, a profile picture, a rude comment, equates to to the interior mind, the entire character of a person. According to the internet, it is possible to tell whether somebody is of a, quote, groomer physiognomy or, quote, a PDF file phenotype. It is possible to tell whether they are honest or dishonest. But putting conspiracy theories and pseudoscience aside, I think we get somewhere toward an answer when we look at the demographic makeup of Gen Z in comparison to previous generations. Gen Z are more racially and ethnically diverse than any generation preceding us. Only 52% of Gen Zers in the United States are classified as white non Hispanic. And this is most definitely reflected in the group of young and upcoming actresses, particularly those cast as Disney princesses. Previously accepted and universal standards of beauty and attractiveness are less readily applied to a generation of multi-ethnic, multiracial, and multi-subcultural individuals. Therefore, it is no wonder that Zendaya, Halle Bailey, and Rachel Zeigler are cast in their their respective roles for embodying both the desired neotenous characteristics of beauty and, importantly, being ambassadors for Gen Z's multiracial and ethnic makeup. It is also no wonder that they don't exhibit the same stereotypical and expected traits of what has always been physiognomically and phrenologically associated with their facial features. That is, their facial features as seen on their white Disney counterparts from the mid-20th century onwards. Because to have wide-set, big eyes immediately makes people think of innocence, openness, and vulnerability. The typical damsel in distress in need of, but most importantly, worthy of saving. These women are anything but damsels. And sometimes, and according to many on the internet, they are just not very nice people when it comes to being creatures of social media oversharing. Before the internet, everybody, from celebrities to your average Joe, just seemed nicer and overall better. The less you know about a person, the better they inevitably seem to you. The less faults you are able to identify and associate with them. And of course, the more ideal they are able to come across to you. Are Zoomers perhaps less attractive because everything, from the good to the bad to the cringeworthy, are there for everybody to see and judge? Are Zoomers perhaps less attractive because they are so starkly different to generations preceding? us, there is something idyllic in the old yearbook photo. That old yearbook photo represented that one day where you would dress up, where you would look your best and make sure that you're remembered for that one photograph, as opposed to being remembered for your various and no doubt not so perfect actions and behavior as a student. Zoomers with their 4K iPhones and selfie fixation oversaturate the internet with photographs and videos documenting 
representing themselves at their best and their worst. There is nothing idyllic nor exceptional about a yearbook photo nowadays. What is also important to note is that 98% of Gen Zers have smartphones. 91% of Zoomers get their first smartphone before they turn 16. Photography and image curation was previously a luxury and privilege of the few. Now, it's a privilege of the majority youth in all their vulnerability, their inexperience, their naivete, and their vanity. Our image and our physiognomy is everywhere. Our profile picture is meant to say a thousand words, even though our attention span is worse than that of a goldfish. First impressions are increasingly not just everything, they are the only thing. No matter what Rachel Ziegler does to redeem her image, she will always be judged and remembered for being the woke and outspoken Disney princess who destroyed the integrity of Snow White. And there's no point in arguing against this, nor presenting any evidence otherwise. As I said, first impressions are the only thing. For instance, an infamous clip of Rachel Ziegler was claimed to be her backhanded and off-the-cuff response to the Snow White backlash. In fact, the clip was taken entirely out of context and even from a completely and entirely different context. It was taken from a vlog that she made on her YouTube channel over a year ago. That is way before the latest controversy regarding how she spoke about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. This video has now been bombarded with the most vitriolic, vile hate that I have perhaps ever seen. That is an everyday vlog that you might see on Emma Chamberlain's channel. Because, and I paraphrase, why debate the issue or hear the other side or the actual truth of the matter? Why humanize a person when you can call them or any person you simply dislike genetically inferior? So I'm not entirely sure sure how to conclude this video. This feels like a topic that is inevitably ongoing. It isn't really concluded. There isn't really anything definitive I can say because inevitably, as I can see, physiognomy is making a comeback. It is everywhere on TikTok. It is very popular amongst Gen Zers who spend a lot of their time on TikTok. And it is as well very popular amongst the right, the extreme or far right on Twitter especially. In an age where critical thinking cannot compete with the easy and lackluster explanations that make us all feel so much more secure in our place in this world and our perceived superior knowledge to the other guy, it is no wonder that when we are faced with more people than humanity has ever been faced with, we try to find easy explanations for everything. It is so much easier to judge somebody's moral character by the bridge of their nose than to actually go into detail research, to actually humanize a person, to actually get to know them. Or even more difficult is to admit and acknowledge to ourselves that we are not all knowing, that we cannot possibly know, and that we are, above all, ignorant. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so very much to all of my patrons, to all of my subscribers, and it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe and help me to get to 180k subscribers. That is my new goal and I would very much appreciate it and love it if you could join this little community that I have here. Thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video as well and remember to let me know what language you would like to learn or have been learning or really have hoped and wished to learn but haven't really known where to start. And let me know generally your thoughts about this video and this topic as it is something that interests me greatly. And I will of course see all of you very, very soon in the next one.